This meeting is being recorded. Guys, what can you see on the screen at the moment? Can you tell somebody tell me what they can see on the screen? Um, the introduction. The, okay. the, the, the no. Wait, this is the yeah, the first screen. Yeah. Engineering yeah, yeah. seminar and okay. webinar. Oh, that's good. Okay. 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 So good afternoon, everyone. You're welcome to um, this webinar. We're so excited that we're able to also be here live at uh, the prestigious Imperial College London. Um, it's, it's fantastic uh, that, you know, we, you know, after lockdown and all that, we're here. Thank you to all that have been able to make it. Um, you know, your weekend is very precious to you, obviously, and you've been able to make it um, um, with us. So uh, today is going to be really exciting. Uh, this is the what number of um, webinars is this? I think this is yeah two two zero four, which is I think the fourth one this year. But obviously over over sixty for a period of time now we've been doing um, the usual protocol. Everyone should remain muted um, when one person is presenting. Please try to mute if you're just joining. Please just mute. Um, so we don't have any uh, hitches, any technical issues. Um, when the presentation starts, please um, use the chat box and try to, you know, put in all your questions in there. Um, please don't interrupt the speaker. Um, and yes, you can also use the chat box to raise your hands if you if you need to if you need to interrupt the speaker. Or please don't interrupt the speaker. <laughs> and um, yes, so. Uh, we would like to acknowledge the presence of a few people. Um, the I don't know if the president is the NSC president engineer. Oh, is, is, okay, the, the past president we have him here, but don't worry. Okay, but all all protocols observed. All fellows and associates, architects. Um, from every other discipline, engineers, scientists, you're all welcome. Um, unfortunately, our president is not here today. Um, I think he's actually on his way to, um, to Imperial College here where we are. Um, so, but I'm here <laughs> and I'll just be um, giving the introduction. So, um, Yes, the membership. In terms of membership, we you can see the slide here. Um, we we have a full range of um, various cadres of membership, which we offer here at, at NSC uh, London UK. Um, you could always just so that we don't waste more, take more of your time. You could always be and get in touch with any of the escorts to for details on membership. Um, and the interesting bit. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so we come to introducing our our um, our speaker for today. Yes, um, Dr. Sunday just sent me my phone. So that I could look at her details, but uh, she happens to be a very close friend of mine and an ex-colleague. So I think I know most of her details offhand. <laughs> uh, yes. So there's so much to say about Mike Amiata. Mike is a wonderful person to start with, and you don't find too many times where you have a good person as well as a very qualified person, as well as a very helpful person. She's full of encouragement to, you know, younger developing um, 
engineers. But I would, I would still open this and have a look at what uh, uh, Dr. Sunday wants me to say about her. I know she's a fellow of the of ICANN-E. It's um, yes, the Institute of Chemical Engineers um, here in the UK. To get to fellow, not just member, is a huge thing. And um, you know, for a, a mom of two, twelve-year-olds or something like that, to achieve it without uh, you know, in the UK here where we don't have uh, childcare. <laughs> No house helps and drivers is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, so Mika is, I'll read from here. Mika is a chartered chemical engineer who specializes in safety and risk uh, loss prevention. She served as an ICME Congress member between October 2018 and November 2019 where she was responsible for advising the Board of Trustees on matters of interest to the ICANN-E members here in the UK. Nike has over 20 years experience designing energy and rail infrastructure facilities. I think this is a very modest <laughs> uh, introduction. I would like to tell you she's, she's worked, she's had very good positions with, um, with Chevron. In fact, she's actually been a consultant, a consultant to Chevron, um, where she's been, she's been an external co consultant to Chevron, so not just a, a, a staff. Um, she's uh, held so many other positions, Heathrow projects, she, you know, various oil and gas offshore, onshore, you name it. I've had the privilege of working with Nike um, at uh, Kellogg's Brown and Root uh, here in the UK, um, where she was the she was the client on the team. So she she represented the client on this multi billion pound project. Nike is a shining example. Uh, she's just she's just a brilliant person, and uh, so without much. Much ado, please join me to welcome uh, our sister and our colleague, Nike Amiata. I, I need to add to that before. I don't know who these guys are talking about, by I the way. To add to that by saying she has been single adamantly helping a lot of new engineers coming to the UK in terms of you know, securing jobs job adverts, where to connect, network to join, and also helping them to practice interview. I did one with her last week. It was fantastic. Things that I would never think about, Nikkei will come up with it. So if you're looking for a job, <laughs> yeah, she's not an agent, or if you're looking for a new job, or you want to move from your current job to a new one, it doesn't matter where your area of expertise is. Please get in touch with Nikkei. She's very, very happy to, uh, to show you the ropes, OK? So, <laughs> Without ado, I'm gonna I'm gonna open your few slides. Uh, <laughs> good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> I, oh, so I think I'll be fine. I think you need, you need oh, to move around. All right. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, there's a disclaimer here. I don't know these guys. So I don't know who they're talking about. <laughs> they must be talking about somebody else. <laughs> but welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome from Nigeria. Welcome from Scotland. And welcome, uh, everybody, uh, and also those in the room. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak today and to talk about my favorite subject. And um, this is just an awareness uh, talk. So if you're a process safety engineer, it's not detailed, but it's just to give people a taste of what my life is like in the process safety world. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> today, uh, well, sorry, I think I've been introduced, so I don't need to introduce myself. So today, uh, I'll be talking to you about a concept called inherently safer design, ISD. And the 
common sense would look at what inherently safer design is, application of inherently safer design, benefits, the four strategies of inherently safer design, when should it be applied, who is responsible for it, and then uh, we do a recap and quiz. And then, um, you know, I'll just check from time to time that people are awake. So I'll be throwing in questions and handing out chocolates to anybody in the room that's able to answer some of the questions. Uh, I've also added uh, three slides in the appendix sec section for anyone who wants to know a little bit more about how to implement inherently safer design on a project that they run. Uh, but I'll keep it fairly simple. I'll make it relevant to real life and hopefully you don't all, all enjoy it. So we all take risks in life. When we go on a plane, we take risks. When we go on very active holidays like skiing, we take risks. When we're cycling on the road, we take risks. And did you even know that as we dress up every day at home, we're taking risks. The BBC did a survey um, back in 2020 on accidents in the house. And it said that it revealed that 6,000 people reported that as they wore their trousers, they tripped over them, or as they pulled up their trousers on the stairs, they tripped on the stairs. So even you know simple things as dressing up is a risk. But we all do these things without batting an eyelid, without uh, thinking about it too much. Why do we do that? I think we do that because somewhere in our heads, we think um, we look at the risk, or we look at the benefits of doing these activities, and we look at the risk, and in our heads, we're thinking, oh, there's more benefits than risk. And so we take the, uh, we do those activities without worrying about the risk. However, in the world that I live in, process safety, working in high hazard, high risk environment. I do not have the luxury to accept the risk I encounter on a daily basis. I have to identify my risk. I have to assess them. I have to manage or control them uh, so that I, I can keep people safe. And I know a lot of engineers do this already, either subconsciously or um, because it's part of good practice. But there's something beyond assessing risks that we can do as engineers. And that concept is what I call inherently safer design. So it's going beyond just identifying risks, assessing them and controlling them. So what is inherently safer design? It's defined as the process of avoiding or eliminating a hazard completely or sufficiently reducing its magnitude or likelihood of occurrence. So just note the word avoiding or eliminating. So it's different now from us controlling or managing the risk. Right. So where can it be applied? It can be applied to the entire life cycle of a process, of a project, or a facility. We can apply this concept in research and development, in design, in construction, operation, maintenance and decommissioning. So all the life cycle stages uh, of our facility. Also, all the modes of operation of these processes, including its manufacturers, transport, storage, use, and disposal. We can apply this concept of inherently safer design. So what are the benefits? And why do you have to spend your time this afternoon listening to this talk? Why do, yeah, why is this important? Why do you have to do it? Why do you have to think about it? Well, for one, you reduce, uh, you comply with regulation. So for example, in the health and safety executive uh, uh, law and um, legislation, uh, offshore in particular, uh, the, sorry, the health and safety executive requires us um, to demonstrate that we are eliminating or we've avoided uh, risks. And if we're unable to do that, we then say there are other things we can do to show that the risks are tolerable or as low as reasonably practicable. Other reasons we want to incorporate in handy safer design on our jobs is to reduce hazards, accidents, and injuries, is to prevent reputational risk. When there's a big accident, like when the BP Macondo happened, BP had big reputational issues, share prices fell, very bad for them. We do not want that. It helps improve morale amongst workers. When workers feel safe in the environment, they're more motivated to work and they're happy people. And if you're on a project, when accidents happen, delays happen on the project because the health and safety executive has to come in, investigate, they shut your project down, you lose billions of pounds, millions of pounds. So, and generally there's collaboration. Projects that put safety first 
tend to have a collaborative approach to doing their work. So earlier I defined uh, inherently safer design, but I'll just go back a step to explain to you where that inherently safer design concept actually comes from. So in the world of process safety engineering or safety engineering, uh, I talked about us assessing and managing or controlling our risks. We manage our risks in five different ways. And this is uh, almost like a formula that all safety engineers use uh, in whatever we do. Even in finance, they probably have a similar concept they use. So the first one, which I'm talking about today, is inherently safer design. The second one is spatial. I'll explain which one later using examples. The third one is passive. The fourth one is active. And the last one uh, is procedural, that is using procedures to ensure your facility is safe. And you can, the most effective method that's encouraged to use is the inherently safer method. Procedural is the least effective, and I'll tell you why. It's because you have to rely on a human being following a set of instructions to keep uh, people or a facility safe. And sometimes humans are stressed, we're tired, or we're sleepy, and we're subject to making errors. So that's why that's used, um, that's the least effective. We don't need to use these strategies in isolation. We can use them in combination on our projects. As a matter of fact, in the oil and gas industry, where Chinedu and I have uh, worked, um, we use this uh, in combination. But the first one we go for is to avoid or to remove the risk. And then we do other things in conjunction with that. Now, let me uh, explain this in real life so that everybody understands. Let us take 90-year-old granddad here. Granddad lives in a two-story property currently. He falls down and then his kids say to him, Dad, you can't live in a two-story building with stairs anymore. As Nigerians will say, it means we don't have money for us to buy a coffin yet, Granddad, so you need to keep yourself safe. And um, they say, oh, uh, so there are two things we can do for you, Dad. We we'll either put you in a bungalow where we do not have stairs and there's nothing to trip over, or we provide you with um, a stair lift to help you to move up. Remember I told you earlier that I explained to you uh, what the five strategies mean. But I just want to see anyway, um, just if anyone's been listening, which of these two strategies do you think is inherently safer design? Remember I said inherently safer design means avoiding or eliminating the hazard. The hazard in our case is as a stair, that granddad fell over. Um, so, which one's an inherently safer strategy? The bungalow or the mechanical means, the stair lift? Does anybody uh, in the room or online want to take a guess? Uh, the bung someone's kindly said yes, yeah, like the bungalow. We're going to throw you a chocolate, Mr. Akin. <laughs> 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 There's a fight, there's a big fight here for chocolate. <laughs> you're you're supposed to be quick and answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> this is the survival of the fittest. I, I, I hope the guys at home are having just as much fun as they're having here. So, the active strategy is the mechanical means, the stair lift, and the bungalow is inherently safer design because we removed the stairs. So now, uh, mechanical, when I talked about that strategy, and I said uh, spatial, passive, active, and procedural. Active is any strategy you use that moves, that helps you to keep things safe. So on a facility like oil and gas, we have our alarms, fire and gas detectors, shutdown facilities, all those mechanical devices that help us to uh, keep the facility safe that moves is our active. So in this case, the stair lift moves, protects standard, that's our active one. So I've explained active and I've also explained inherently safer design using a simple real life example. So if you're ever at work in your jobs, you don't have to be a process safety engineer by the way to implement this concept. Everybody has to implement it. Just always think the granddad example, we took out the stairs that caused granddad the problem. So in your job, think whether you're electrical, civil, mechanical, think about that one hazard you can remove or eliminate to keep people safe, to keep the environment safe, and to keep yourself safe. Uh, if you can't avoid, there are other strategies that you can employ. But maybe that will be it for another seminar. Uh, so now, for those of us in oil and gas and refining, let's just use the refining example now. 
So can everybody see, uh, if you look to the north, so this is a refinery. If you look to the north of the refinery or northeast, where there's like a red circle, that circle represents, uh, there are three white buildings there. Now, the three white buildings are separated from the refinery. Okay, okay. Are separated from the refinery. And the reason we do this, where we put a greater distance between the facility and the property, is to keep uh, people, personnel, safe and away from a hazardous facility. This facility here you can have explosions, fires, toxic relief that can kill people. So you need to make sure any building where people are occupied, like a control room, like offices, accommodation buildings, you create a distance between the facility and the toxic. The health and safety executive and other um, uh, regulatory bodies specify, depending on the country you're in, but they are generally the same, what that distance should be. Also, sometimes safety engineers carry out what we call the fire and hazard, uh, fire uh, has, uh, hazard and explosion analysis, fire and explosion hazard analysis, sorry. Um, uh, and this will give you the distance that you must specify to ensure your buildings, where people of the occupied buildings are separate from the facility. So this is an example of a spatial strategy of managing risk. Okay, so, so I've talked about Henry safety design, I've talked about active strategy, I've talked about uh, uh, spatial, now we go to passive. Here we have a sodium hydroxide tank. It's kept within a bond. Uh, the bond contains any spillages. So when you're filling the tank, you can have spillages. The tank itself can be leaking if there's corrosion somewhere on the tank or on the flange or valves, and then you get a spillage or a release. Uh, and so what the bond does is it contains it. To the left or west of the bond, uh, there's some, I think it's like a valve or tap or something. What we do is we connect the hose to it and we use a pump to suck the liquid out. And then the tanker takes it away to dispose of it in a safe way. Or maybe they use a drum or something and they go dispose of it uh, use, uh, with, uh, through contractors as uh, specialized in doing these things. The reason we do this is with uh, sodium hydroxide is corrosive. It's harmful to personnel, their skin and eyes. It's harmful to the environment. It can pollute the environment, kill marine life. So we have to contain it this way so that we can meet environmental legislation um, here. So this one's passive. In passive strategy, we are not using mechanical means. We're using physical barrier. And the physical barrier in this case is the bond. So I've gone through all the different uh, strategies now that we use in process risk management. And today I'm focusing on the inherently safer design strategy. So I'll go into that now. So remember I said to you, inherently safer design is the avoidance or elimination of hazard. Within that concept, we can take four approaches. One is minimize, the second one is substitute, the third one is moderate, and the fourth one is simplify. Rather than me standing here explaining all of this to you, I, I think it'd be good for me to show everybody a video so I can keep quiet and make it a little bit more uh, interesting. Let's see if we can get our video on. Bear with us, please. Okay. Okay, sit down, enjoy. Can everybody hear? Can, did you hear anything? Can someone tell us in, in the uh, on Zoom if they can hear the sound? Hello? Yes, we can hear the sound. Okay, very well. Yeah, but it's cracking a bit. That's your connection. <laughs> On August 28, 2008, a powerful explosion killed two workers and injured eight others at the Bayer Crop Science Plant in Institute, West Virginia, just outside of Charleston, the state capital. 
A chemical safety board investigation found the accident resulted from a runaway chemical reaction inside a process vessel used to treat pesticide waste. The CSB determined that if the exploding vessel had taken a different trajectory, pieces of it could have hit nearby pipe, potentially causing a release of highly toxic methyl isocyanate, or MIC, the same dangerous chemical that killed thousands in Bhopal, India, in 1984. The CSB determined that the explosion at Bayer could have caused a release of MIC into the nearby community. And it raised the question, was there an inherently safer alternative to storing and using this highly toxic chemical? At the direction of Congress, the CSB commissioned the National Academy of Sciences, or NAS, to study the feasibility of reducing or eliminating the inventory of MIC stored at the Bayer plant. The NAS study explored how the concept of inherent safety could be applied in the Bayer facility. Dr. Dorothy Zoland directs the NAS's Board on Chemical Sciences and Technology, which assembled a diverse panel of experts to conduct the study. Inherently safer process assessment is a tool that can allow companies, employees, uh, engineers, and corporate officials to take a fresh look at how to carry out their business in a way that would not only be safer, but would also perhaps be uh, better in terms of other business decisions. Industry experts generally describe four main approaches to inherently safer design. They are minimize, reducing the amount of hazardous material in the process, substitute, replacing one material with another that is less hazardous, Moderate, using less hazardous process conditions, such as lower pressures or temperature. And simplify, designing processes to be less complicated and therefore less prone to failure. Inherently safer design is a philosophy for design and operation of any technology, including chemical processing. It's not a specific technology uh, or a set of tools and activities, but it's really an approach to design and it's, it's a way of thinking. Longtime industry consultant Dennis Hendershot served on the NAS study panel and spoke in 2009 at a CSB public meeting about the advantages of inherently safer processes. And what that means is that the safety features are built right into the process, not added on. Hazards are eliminated or significantly reduced rather than controlled or managed. The NAS panel noted that the goal of inherently safer design is not only to prevent an accident, but to reduce the consequences of an accident should one occur. That helps make emergency preparedness efforts more focused and effective. Yes, that's okay. I hope everybody enjoyed that. I think oh, I think it summarizes my talk over the last five minutes uh, in a much nicer and understandable way, and also explains those four types of uh, inherently safer design approach. So, uh, okay. Seems to be stuck. Uh, something's going on. Sorry, we're having technical issues. Sorry, guys, at home. <laughs> so 
me, I wouldn't go through this. Yeah, I, I wouldn't bother going through the four approaches or principles because that's already been covered. But when you get the slides, uh, you know, they're there for your reference. And just so there you've got the definition and the uh, examples, so the four different types. So move swiftly. So rather than me explaining those four types, what I would like to do is to use real life strat um, examples to bring those four approaches to life. So to explain the strategy of substitutes, uh, I've got a window cleaner here. So one window cleaner is using a ladder to clean the window. He's not wearing his helmet, he's not using a harness. Uh, so that's a very unsafe act. So this was in the construction industry and not in someone's wasted property. <laughs> this would be, you know, uh, a non-conformance. In the second picture, we've got a wiser cleaner who's working at great. He's using a longer brush to clean the window. Uh, and so what they've done here is they've substituted the unsafe behavior, which or safe equipment, or safe equipment, which is a ladder with a safer, uh, longer brush to clean the window. So he's removed the hazard, but it's, it's substituted because he substituted a safer equipment uh, with, uh, so it's, it's safer with the, with, well, replace the ladder with the uh, longer brush. And this is the, the, an illustration in real life of the example of substitute. Sorry? Yeah, that's the, that's the oh, yeah, the tap. for the tap, yeah. yeah. I was expecting a question to come. <laughs> I, I, want, I wanted to actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can have questions. We can have quest, questions here, but. Um, we can find if we ask a question. If you, okay, we can. We can. There's a quiz at the end. There's a quiz. There's a quiz at the end. Well, I've got like 10 questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, these guys are having too much fun in the room. <laughs> So the, the second one, which is minimization or elimination, this is a construction industry example. And at the, the, the unsafe one is at the top of the building, they're assembling the guardrail. They use the guardrails to prevent people or equipment or uh, objects from being thrown over down. So who cuts people down at the, below the building? But an inherently safer example is if you preassemble it at grade on the shop floor workshop, and then you just place it uh, at the top of the building before your construction starts. So uh, they're wearing their PPE, so that's a good thing, but what they're doing is not necessarily inherently safe. Traditionally, this is how we would do it in the construction industry, but people are now starting to think about inherently safer design in their jobs. And people have said, let's preassemble that grid, and then we just put it in place at the top of the building. And they use a crane to lift it up. So this one's an example in the construction, and it's minimized or eliminated. So eliminate because they've eliminated the need or the process of having to assemble at the top of the building. So that's why I say it's minimization and elimination tends to be the same. Minimization, if you're looking at it that way, could also be where minimizing or reducing the, the likelihood of someone falling over. Because remember, I said the definition of inherently safer design is you start by avoiding or eliminating. If you can't avoid or eliminate, you then look for a way to reduce the likelihood of the accident from happening. Or if the uh, accident then happens, you look for a way to reduce the effect on people, the impact on people. So in this case, then reducing their likelihood, minimizing their likelihood of falling over uh, to the bottom of the building. Uh, so that's an example of minimization or el elimination approach. Let's see if that's uh, another one. So this example, uh, is from the offshore oil and gas industry, in case we have people in that industry online here. Traditionally, we used to have an offshore platform, Stina even would know here, uh, I think that might be his area, and we used to have uh, just one offshore platform, where you see there's a story building, white story building, I think, oh, okay, my mouse, okay. So here where my mouse is, there's a white story building with a heli deck, and we have the buildings, accommodation area on the same platform as uh, the processing area. We it, traditionally we would say that we're still separating accommodation area 
from the processing area. Because I, I, if you look at that picture where my mouse is, there's like a space between the processing area here and the accommodation, accommodation area here. So if there were a fire in the processing area, we would have enough time to escape. Uh, either through the heli deck by, by a helicopter or through a tent, uh, like a escape, like a boat, sexy boat to escape. But people have now started thinking about many safer design, and they're like, actually, why do we? Uh, why should we have just one platform? It's not safe enough. So what people do now, if you look at the second picture, we have three separate platforms. The first one marked in red with number one is where the wellhead platform is. And that's the most dangerous part of this facility where you get the crude uh, from the seabed. And it's really done at high pressure. And uh, you know, it, it can get us of serious accidents from there. And what they've done is they separated it by, because it's a linked bridge to the processing area, which is number two, where my mouse is. And then that's, there's another linked bridge uh, to where the accommodation is. So whenever you see the heli deck, that tends to be where the accommodation or office buildings are. So the office buildings, uh, the office building is far away from where the most hazard is, which is a wellhead area by this link thing. So if there's ever a problem, there'll be enough time uh, for people to escape. So this example, can someone tell me which process risk strategy? So remember, although I'm talking about uh, inherently safer approach or strategy, when you think of the process of risk management, there's also another strategy of process risk management adopted here apart from this moderate strategy because remember special oh let me give you Tine, do we have your, which only one the cadres or the fifth cards or or the, let me give you the bigger one for the children what is that one <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> for that. oh. <laughs> so we have special special risk management strategy because they've left greater distance between the hazard and where people are but as, as also part of energy safer design, this is moderate strategy. There are three definitions of moderate strategy. One of it is if you're working as a chemical engineer on a processing facility, you can lower your temperature or pressure because that means that your hazards are, uh, are reduced. If you're, if you're on a safe processing facility, you can um, segregate. So in the case of that uh, sodium hydroxide, there's some people that work with these types of chemicals on a daily basis. You have to separate, or, or let me use a better example. Remember when we had COVID and on the news, you'd see the lab, uh, the scientists, they put their hands in gloves in a cupboard doing uh, some assessments. That cupboard is a form of energy safer design because it segregates or separates the scientists from the coronavirus virus. Yeah. And then there's usually like a film cupboard, like a uh, vent an air that sucks out any uh, uh, air that they can breathe in to catch the virus. And so in that kind of industry, I think it's pharmaceuticals, it's uh, also a way of view moderating. So it's an inherently safer design uh, strategy that they are um, um, doing. And then the third type, if you're working on a facility, the third type of um, third example of moderate strategies, when you leave separation or when you if anything that involves separation or segregation, or lowering of the, the conditions of your processes is all under moderate strategy. So you can see that in this example, we used a lot of the methods actually. So it's not just one we're using at a particular point in time. Okay, uh, let me see if I have, okay, so I've gone through all my examples. The simplify, I didn't quite have an example for it, but I think a, an obvious example would be, rather than have someone climb uh, uh, like a ladder to fix something. You make sure the equipment is at grid so they can easily reach it. Somewhere that is that is a, a person, maybe at 1.1 meter, 1.2 meter, without bending, without stretching, they can easily get to that equipment uh, to fix whatever they want to fix. So that would be a simplified, simpl a simplified strategy. So now uh, I've gone through the explanation of a many safer design. The next thing is when exactly do we implement a many safer design? At what stage? Because everything has a life cycle. Whether it's a facility, there's a life cycle there. Whether it's a project, uh, whatever is a life cycle. So uh, some of the gurus of safety have uh, advised that the best time to implement in every safer design strategy is at the concept or preliminary design phase. And what this is showing is is the bits where you spend the less money. 
Some people still think you're spending a lot of money, but when you think of doing it at construction, you actually spend less money. At the concept and preliminary design stage, is an idea stage. Everyone's still bouncing ideas. Nothing is fixed. No equipment has been bought. Exactly. Yeah. And you're still trying to say, okay, how should we, how should we design our facility to meet our business objectives or production objectives? Or uh, for those in the railway, how many passengers we want to carry in a year? What are, what, what, how do we design this to carry those number of passengers? So at that stage, you can change things and implement the Henry safer design. Once you get to construction or even end of detail design, procurement has ordered all your long lead items. People have started buying stuff. Early works have started at site. You spend a lot of money to implement an early safer design then. The thing is, you can inherit safer design can be used in all life stages. I said that at the beginning, but there are different ways you use them. So at the concept and preliminary, you'd use those four strategies I talked about generally. When you move to construction, the only thing you can do is okay, what they like looking at how you can do the actual construction safely, like that guardrail example. But you can't actually change the design anymore. But you can change the way you work so that your uh, colleagues in construction work safely and don't hurt themselves. You can also learn lessons because in handy safer design is about continuous improvement. It's innovative, it's creative, and so we have to look for creative ways to do our job safely. So you look at lessons learned from previous projects and see how can we do this construction safer, safer for people, safer for environment, so that all together we can uh, become uh, profitable because if the companies are doing well because there are no accidents, they don't have to pay out, we still will remain in jobs. So we should always remember that safety is not just a compliance thing. Companies have to keep doing their businesses safely. We, the people, also need to have jobs and also be safe as we do our jobs. So in operations, there are things they can do as well. In, in operations, you don't actually have any heavy safer design you do. But what you do is you preserve what the designers have put there that's inherently safe. Operations people, by the time you get to 10 years, 15 years of operating your facility, it needs repairs, it needs maintenance, you start to take pumps out, take valves out. But the question is, how do you ensure that that thing you're taking out doesn't mess up the whole inherently safer design? So you also have to go back to the inherently safer design reports. A workshop they've done, look at why they put it there, engage uh, safety specialists, especially people that are well versed in the heavy safer design, to look at the situation for you before you start going in to change things and repair things so you can preserve that heavy safer design uh, concept that they put there. Also, when we get to demolition or dismantling or decommissioning, if it's on an offshore, offshore platform, you've got very hazardous conditions that can blow up. You need to make sure you do your hazard identification workshop. You put your inert uh, gas nitrogen through the pipes to purge it to make sure there are no hazardous things in there that can be released and kill the people dismantling it. So at that stage, that is how you implement inherently safer design. So I'm almost done. So the next question, another quiz. So having said all the things that I've said, can anybody guess? Oh, I think I might have given this out. <laughs> what what can people at home see? Let me see. What can people at home see? Oh, the same thing. Oh, okay, that's a shame. Because I was going to I was going to just say who is responsible for implementing inherently safer design. <laughs> but I didn't know I didn't um I didn't do the no no so everybody is responsible so as I, I was supposed to everybody is responsible for implementing in heavy safer design um because it's whether you're technical or non-technical i say non-technical because if you tell the finance director you need money or budget to keep something safe if he doesn't understand in heavy safer design he probably won't give you the budget to do what you want to do or the project manager wants so both technical and non-technical procurement people to need to be aware they need to check their vendors, make sure the vendors have manufactured the equipment properly before they order them. Uh, safety engineers, we're not the only ones responsible for safety. We're there to facilitate, to train, to provide guidance, to coach people, to you know help them to be able to see how they can remove hazards from their design. And finally, if you're a leader here, senior management, director, project director, or director on a refinery, your responsibility would be to support inherently safer design visibly. Walk around, talk to people, find out what they're doing, communicate it to them. But most importantly, 
provide the budget, the resource, the people to help them achieve a nearly safer design on your project or on your facility. And that brings me, I think, to the end of my um, let me just see, so the end of my presentation. I think my, my presentation went back just a minute. I like to let me remove this from this one. So because I've got a quiz and I don't want it to show the answers. Uh, so I'm gonna try to how do I <laughs> thank you. Let me just end by saying thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Uh, I'm just going to try and do a quiz now, but I want to, I've got the answers showing there and I want to try to remove the answers. Keep talking. You can also. Oh, they can see. Oh, I can keep talking. Okay, all right. Student. <laughs> okay. That's what it is. Oh, all right. Okay. So I'm just going to uh, do a recap and uh, quiz to see who was sleeping <laughs> during the talk. <laughs> okay. So, what are the five process risk management strategies? Anybody wants to say? Maybe we should involve people at home. Unfortunately, we don't. We can't yeah. get the. Uh, Put it in the chat. The five process risk management strategies. No cheating, no checking online. <laughs> Any answers? Oh, well, someone said one. Okay, can can one person say all five? <laughs> Anybody that wants to say all five? <laughs> I can see Mr. Benga Abgola online. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, he's oh, is he on mute? He's uh, typing in, he's typing in. So Mr. Binga Bola is starting to type. Uh, nobody seems to be competing with him online. He's, he's got two rights. He's got passive, active, he's got spatial. Anybody, nobody seems to be uh, writing in the answers other than Binga. <laughs> Everyone's been sleeping. I hope my talk wasn't boring. <laughs> also, uh, is that what they said ISD? No, no, the question is what are the five? Yeah, um, oh, yeah, 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 sorry. What are the five? What are the ISD? Okay, thank you, Mr. Tunde. I think, uh, how, is he, how are we going to get this chocolate? But well, Mr. Benga gave us four answers. He gave us four answers. Okay, so what we'll do is uh, we've got two volunteers that have given us answers. So Mr. Tunde finished the feed for Mr. Benga. So we'll have to find a way. Dr. Kokwala has kindly offered to. Um, to send the, uh, is it four? It's five. So it's inherently safer design. That's it. Oh, One, sorry, two, three, sorry. four, five. Yes. So I'm just going to paste the answers into the chat for everybody to see. So those are the answers. Thank you, Dr. Mokwala. The second question is uh, what is inherently safer design? You can just use one word, one word to explain it. What is inherently safer design? We'll put the question in the chat. Anybody wants to chat? Don't put it Anybody wants to try online at home? Or anybody, anybody here in the audience? Oh, no one's no one's uh... oh, to avoid. Okay. <laughs> to <eliminate>. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's the question for us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> cheating. And then we've got the, the last one. Uh, we've got uh, the, the answer. Okay, we'll give the answer here. Yeah. The answer to this. So it could, it could it could mean so what's the energy safety design? One word to reduce it, avoidance of hazards or elimination of hazards or reduction of hazards. But the third question coming, if anyone's interested. Uh, what are the four strategies or the four approaches of inherently safer design? <laughs> Everybody must know this. Everybody must know this. Wait, Are people bored? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone in the room? We've oh, got chicken who isn't allowed anymore to answer. <laughs> it was the, oh, uh, look at that. Oh, someone uh, said that. Oh, Mr. Tunde. Thank, right. Thank you very much, yeah. Mr. Tunde. <laughs> isn't it? <Yeah>. <laughs> 
And the fourth question, okay, we'll put the answer there. Who is responsible for implementing inherently safer design? Who is responsible for implementing? Oh, Major Binga, thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, <laughs> he said, okay, we'll give you. <laughs> he said it before. <laughs> This question When is the cheapest life cycle stage to implement inherently safer design? Concept. Yes. Concept design stage. There's a second one of preliminary. Okay. Thank you, uh, Margaret. <laughs> oh, the deputy vice president. Erelu, thank you, Erelu. Erelu means the chief. <laughs> oh, really? Oh. Oh. And our final question What are the benefits of implementing inherently safer design? That's our final question for the day. Anybody? What are the benefits? We need someone new that's not said anything. Charlotte. Oh, Charlotte. <laughs> any any response? Benefits of inherently safer design? One, just one or two. Okay, all right. So, oh, less less hazards. Good. Thank you, Mayor Abola. <laughs> Anyone else? What are the benefits of implementing a healthy safer design? Okay, all right. So just put the answer there. Maybe people are getting bored. <laughs> okay. What about um uh minimizing the answer is oh we put the answer cost over cost over yeah to prevent cost over run, thank you, and project delays. So thank you very much. That's the key word. <laughs> Thank you. <Ed> <laughs> All okay. Thank you, everyone, for participating and bringing a bit of life into the into the talk. I hope everyone at home enjoyed it and everyone in the room. Uh, and I hope at least you will take one thing away. Hopefully, the granddad example will go with you. <laughs> And the word avoid, eliminate, or reduce. I hope those two things, uh, the three words and the granddad example will go with you. Um, those are my references. Question, it's question time now. If anybody has any questions. Thank you very much for being a fantastic audience. Wow, that was, that was fantastic. Um, a really, really, really good one. In fact, yeah, round of applause for for Nike. I, I didn't expect any less than that um, level of delivery. Do we have any questions? Should I go to the chat? Uh, please omit. <laughs> yeah, she's very, very, very lively. Yeah, so we. <laughs> we I think we'll, we'll take questions now. Uh, okay. Okay. I hope I can answer your questions. I, I, I might disappear if I can answer the questions. I, I'll have one on the desk. I'll talk. Uh, okay. So should we take the questions in the in the chats first, or maybe live first? I think we should take live first. Yeah. Yeah. Let yeah. So. Let's get people talking. Um, let's unmute. Um, oh, those are our questions, actually. Yeah. Okay, Engineer Sami, sir, your question. Oh, uh, it's not really a question. Okay, maybe it's a question, too. But it's similar to CDM, isn't it? Uh, I suppose yep. so. I suppose so. But, uh, in, in CDM, I think you're still doing the control and uh, using procedures and doing the management side. But these days, I think people focus also on avoiding and elimination in the CDM uh, regulation. 
Yeah, yeah, in CDM regulation too, you also eliminate and avoid if you can okay. as much. Then what then happens is if the risk that you cannot manage, yeah, yes. you yes. yeah, there is that, that's the one you control, and that's the one yes. you try to reduce. But you yes. still follow the same process. The one you can eliminate completely, you eliminate them, and you indicate that it's eliminated. Anyone that the risk is still there, you reduce. And yes. of course, the one you reduce, if it's still there, you like to rightly put it, which is similar to the ISV, mm -hmm. similar to the CDM on, you also yes. control and inform. Yes. Because yes. in that case, the risk is still there, but how do you manage it? Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. It was insightful yeah. because it's good to see how other people in other industries do things. Yeah. And I believe in uh, CDM, they use the phrase safety in design or yes. to prevent <laughs> to design. Yes, you know, we, we all do the same thing, but in different yeah. industries, we have different yeah. terminology. So I really yeah, appreciate but... your, your extra, um, uh, you know, your experience that you've brought to this for those in the house that are in the construction industry. Thank you very much. For that. No, oh, it's my pleasure. But just to say one thing, your ke okay. you chemical engineers, even in the construction industry, they've actually taken over. They are the one running, for example, in the project I have, the lady <laughs> who, is, who is running it is actually yes. a chemical engineer uh, yes. in terms of safety, running the yes. safety. It's on the HS2 project. And she's in Nigeria. Zena. <laughs> Okay. I think I know a Nigerian on that project actually, but we don't mention her name. <laughs> 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 yeah. Somebody is talking in her. CDM looks at it from that point of view of avoidance and minimizing. And what it does as well is, I will give you a very good example the use of, the use of news. Yeah. F E W T S. Right. In, in construction, definitely, they, they try to kind of avoid the use of ladder completely. Mm -hmm. So now what they do now is they just uh, they use their new which are mobile elevating work platforms. These are working platforms that can move anywhere, even without anybody's luggage, is automated and stuff like that. Safer, cheaper, at the same time, definitely cost and time saving as well. Okay. So that's a consideration we have on that CDM as for safer working mm -hmm. environments. Oh, thank you for that. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad everybody's really contributed to this. Uh... All right, do we have anybody else at all? Thank you very much for that. Okay, so do we have any other questions here before we go to people? Okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll take my question. Please, I encourage people to still put in your questions if you have. Those oh, online. Here. It is unfortunately very difficult to hear. Oh, wow. oh okay. Okay, can you hear now? Okay, I'm speaking. Can you hear Margaret? I think Charlotte was Charlotte was saying. Charlotte, can you hear now? Okay. Yes, we, we we can hear, but it's it's not very clear. Okay, so is it clearer now? There's an echo. There's an echo. Yeah. Oh, everybody mute their phones. Have people got their phones? Maybe mute their phones. Echo and side side noise. Okay. Um, okay, so I don't know why we just continue. Is it is it better now? Yeah. Not yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> Somehow, yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. okay. So we, maybe we, we'll we decided on. to let you know because we think it is important also for future presentations for this combination yeah. of online and virtual and uh, on site to secure that it it long term is is okay. No? Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so um, the the next question, well, the question next on the, on the chat is one for myself, and uh, it's to Nike, and I say, you used the bond wall example as a way of explaining pass the passive um, safety prevention strategy. Are there 
fasting strategies for preventing hazardous gas exposure. Gas. So would there be a passive approach? Because the bond wall would 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 prevent um, spillage. So it would pre prevent the liquid one from. Uh, so it's just the gaseous one. Oh yeah, the gaseous. So I worked on a project, the Kazakhstani project in Kazakhstan. Their food oil is sour. And mm -hmm. Sour means it has hydro hydrogen sulfide gas that can kill you within seconds. Without you and detecting the smell, yes, it's odorless. Yeah, you know, very detecting. And what we used to do, this is what we call temporary refuges. And so mm -hmm. the bus would, so when the alarm goes, mm -hmm. there are buses that are also pressurized. So everybody would get in very quickly mm -hmm. and they would drive them to temporary refuges that are built uh, mm -hmm. uh, specifically to, to make them airtight and also mm -hmm. to prevent uh, explosions. They can okay. withstand large explosions and fire them. The toxic, uh, toxic release. Okay. So I think that'll be an example. So using gas capacity. detectors. No, there, there'll be that gas, gas detectors everywhere. But the temporary refuges are buildings. Okay. They're buildings that are airtight, okay. that are a bit far away from how far these toxic gases can get to. Mm -hmm. So say you're on a construction site on a facility, there are buses that will then take because these spaces are far, like where the accidents can happen to, uh, where people can be like a safe refuge area. And you can't even put them nearby, you shouldn't, okay. so that they don't get uh, affected by the toxic gas. So they get on the buses, the buses then go to this uh, temporary refuge building that are mm -hmm. airtight and plus food, okay. and they go into high space. So I think I can use that as an example of a passive method okay. for gases. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, there's another question. So there's a question. Um, Sodium Please, um, let your questions keep coming through. I have one more. Um, okay, so Nike. Yeah, so, is it is it still very difficult to hear? Benga, uh, are you online? Can you hear us? Is Benga online? Benga, can you hear us? People are still saying they can't hear us. I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Okay. I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Here it is. Okay. Maybe it's just people's uh, internet connection. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so I'll take one question. Please um, carry on um, dropping questions in the message um, section. So my question is, the recent, in fact, there was an explosion mm. on a floating production um, vessel, mm. an FPSO in Nigeria in February. <laughs> and um, the first thing that came to my mind, bang on, when you talked about the structural method where we separate the living quarters yeah. from the production the processing, processing area. areas is for a floating production system where you have one vessel mm. and everything has to be, you know, you can't really have various um, platforms connected by bridges mm. like you pointed out in your presentation. How do we achieve, what sort of strategy do process engineers adopt in achieving safety in such vessels? And, um, you know, obviously in this recent explosion, three people died. He said there were 10 people in very close proximity mm -hmm. with the, um, you know, where the explosion occurred. So it's a problem. So how, what do, what do you do as process engineers for process floating, safety engineers? Yes, yes. process safety, yes, for, for floating production systems where mm -hmm. you just have everybody in one vessel. Thank you very much. I think this is a question where I'm going to hide under the uh, <laughs> desk now. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Uh, a while back, I did an uh, FLNG uh, project. And we, uh, we tend to do a lot of analysis, fire and explosion analysis mm -hmm. on, on this kind of facilities. And what those analysis show to us is the distance, minimum distance we should leave between those accommodation areas and processing areas to at least buy people Fine. time to yes. escape. And that guides uh, our, uh, how long, you know, the length or yeah. the size of the FLNG. Yeah. No doubt you're right that it's difficult yeah. because it's enclosed. Yeah. Another thing we can do is we demonstrate that we reduce our risk by also mm -hmm. reducing the number of people okay. on the facility. Yeah, when you have less people, emergency escape is also easier. Yeah. So you only have essential people you need to have on that facility yes. so that they can escape because we, it's people we care about, not, not the assets. We can always get assets back, we can always repair assets, yes. but we can't get people's life back. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, so we reduce people, yeah. we do our analysis, yeah. that will guide our distances. We then reduce the number of people on the, at any point in the facility, yeah. and we also do ships uh, work as well, and put in uh, the number of people. And then the third thing we do, which is the key thing, which a lot of process engineers are probably thinking I should have mentioned, is we use firewalls. Yeah. This, uh, and blast, exactly. blast blast protected, blast resistant yeah. structures. Yeah. So those plus resistant structures, uh, but we also have to be careful because we're on water. Weight yes. is a problem. Yeah. If it's too heavy, you can't, on FPSO, it's a problem. And it's also very costly yeah. to the owners of the facility. So it's all a way of balancing it. And this is why we start to talk about options, yeah. looking at which option will give us the best safety. Yes. So there's that blast resistant walls yeah. and the, uh, uh, the, um, fire resistance walls. Yes, yes. But again, we must be careful with these walls because if it's too enclosed, yes. when things are too enclosed and in congested uh, situations, it can also encourage uh, ex explosion. Yes. So we all have to get a lot of specialists on board to see, to balance it out and see what is the uh, the best extent of yes. blast protected wall or yes. fire resistant wall versus number of people versus the distance you're, you're leaving. Yeah. It's quite a lot of analysis or thought yeah. behind it for us engineers are capable of doing this. Yeah. Yes. I hope I've been able to answer your question. Yes. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, I'll have to hide yeah. under the table because I've got nothing else to say. Yeah. Another question. Much. Yes, <laughs> not, not really another question. Okay. Good afternoon. And um, I've been mandated as a class monitor here to say mm -hmm. one word or two. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> So before we really kind of get too excited and then we while away time, we need to kind of recognize the presence of um, the deputy president of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, uh, Irelu Margaret Ogutala. Uh, we have not have, we have not ignored you, ma. 
And um, at this juncture, we want you to say one word or two regarding what we have uh, just started. It's a new initiative, and I think it's one of its kind in the UK, whereby we are breaking post COVID. And we are doing physical. Let's clap for ourselves. I know she wants to do the dance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are not only the buyers, but breaking the COVID barrier as well. There's a lot to eat, and there's so many people here to enjoy it. And I think we'll be expecting you next time. So, Eric, anyway, can you say a word? And uh, you want to say a word regarding this? And make sure you let it uh, ring over there in Nigeria. Yes, we are now past COVID in London. Thank yes. you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Um, first, I must apologize for joining a bit late. I, I had planned to attend and uh, I just left off. <laughs> and by the time I looked at the time, it was like 3.30 or something. So anyway, but it's the, the much that I was able to witness was very, was great. The, the lecture, and I mean, there is no alternative to safety. And, uh, and in, inherently safer design will guarantee the safety of processes, you know, and, and then to guarantee um, less hazards or, or in fact, complete elimination of hazards. So I congratulate the branch for this. And I congratulate all of you for being able to come together. Um, the restriction has been so bad. And there's really nothing like uh, as good as the uh, in-person meeting as you have put decided to tag the meeting. It's, it's much better, you know, one, because one of the things that we want to achieve by coming together as engineers is to be able to see one another, you know, sometimes it's even, even if it's just to let down your hair, you know, just go somewhere else other than your office or your home, or your home. it makes a lot of difference. And then there's, there's so much that you can do together when you are together, when you are, when you are together physically than you could ever achieve uh, online. So congratulations for breaking the barrier. <laughs> We've been doing that here in Nigeria for some time, but you know, I know how difficult it is in, uh, in the UK. So I congratulate you and I, 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 in fact, I say kudos for taking advantage of, uh, of this time, you know, to come together and to organize this wonderful lecture. Somebody pointed out that the, uh, looks like it looks like chemical engineers have taken over the safety um, <laughs> space. <laughs> well, well, I think it, I think it's just normal. Most of the, the most hazard, hazardous hazardous processes are usually chemical. Yeah. Uh, I mean, are chemical engineering processes. So it, it's just it's just it's just normal that the chemical engineers would uh, take charge or take the lead, you know, in in safety. And I'm a proud chemical engineer too. So, so oh. Nikkei. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, the first day I saw that, I saw the notice that, I, okay, this lecture is going to be delivered by a fellow of IKME. I and I, I was like, okay, this is one lecture that I cannot afford to miss. And I'm glad that I did not miss the entire lecture. It was fun as well as educative, very impactful, yet very lively. So, Thank congratulations. You. Madam, and my name is Margaret Ogutala, please. So, because when she said uh, Margaret, somebody said, ah, no, she's deputy president. She said, my name is Margaret, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, one thing, one thing, Ma, before you go, uh, this time yes. I've been told from the grapevine that the last time you were in London, you sneaked out without visiting us. Next time yes, I sneaked in and out. <laughs> exactly. Next time you come to London, we're not going to let you go. So you have to give us a lecture before you go. So just get prepared, man. <laughs> I, I, I will. I will. I will. I will, by God's grace. Thank and you thank much. you. Thank you for the okay. honor of the invite. Thank you. Okay, we want to also recognize the presence of the Glasgow chairman, uh, Dr. Shewun Adidiran. Uh, Dr. Shewun, can you give us a word, please? Are you there, Dr. Shewun? Dr. Shinwa Dibiro, are you there? Yeah. Ask, yeah. Oh, ask him to ask him to mute. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, that's fine. Maybe whenever it comes around to receive them, we can just have it just to kind of recognize all other dignities as well. Uh, I will hand over to our MC for today, the Amiable Engineer. <laughs> today, go over to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, okay, thanks, Chairman. Yes, yeah, so I think um, I think we have we've gone through most of the questions now. Um, I don't know if any of us have any other questions from those online. I, and if we don't, I have one last question and then. I'm going to hide from you. No, no way. Do do. Please, does anyone have a question, please? Okay, so I'll, I'll ask the final question so that we, we, that we are conscious of time. Um, Mike. Is there a way we could prevent uh, vandalism of oil and gas pipelines in Nigeria through some preventive safety design or preventive monitoring systems or something? Because that's obviously it's hazardous for those who vandalize it. You know, people who have no clue about these gases just go and break it. And it's terrible for our, you know, our records and for the environment and for the government. You know. So if there was a preventive way of addressing that, and what advice would you give to the body in Nigeria called the Nigerian Oil Spill Detection and Response Agency? <laughs> yeah. So. Yes, the, the oil bunkery, even oil, you know, oil bunkery and people refining. Yes, yeah, black. Yes, so that's the question we have for uh, engineer Nike today. And obviously, it's all being recorded, and it's, we're going to advise you just to help us as a nation because obviously, it's a problem. So. Okay. And anyone online that has an has an idea, because we're all brainstorming on this. So please, um, someone has said something about fiber optics. Um, um, hello, everyone. Um, oh, okay. Cool. I once worked on a project that was meant to be um, situated in the war zone between Oman and uh, Yemen, I think, and for a gas pipeline. And the prev there wasn't any uh, kind of preventive way of ensuring the pipeline wasn't vandalized. But basically what they did was to lay fiber optics on the pipeline, um, bury it, um, and ensure that as soon as there's a leak, the system is shut down immediately to avoid any accident from happening or loss contain and containing the loss as well. So yes, uh, using fiber optics could work. It's expensive. Well, I don't know. As I then it was expensive, but laying fiber optics on the pipelines will, could go a long way to prevent uh, vandalization as well. So. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Abuela, for your answer. Yes, I do remember it's true. When I worked on a pipeline project, we used fiber optics to, uh, for leak detection. They use okay, they use fiber optics for leak detection. But as um, Linda was talking, I started to think, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. In some countries, no matter what you put or checks you put in, some people will still find a way of uh, doing whatever vandalism or you know whatever they want to do. So I think an additional thing we could do is cultural awareness. I think it's this uh, attitude of damage or stealing uh, crude from pipelines and places is so embedded and something that we need to stop. But it's also through education, awareness. So these bodies you talked about, maybe they need to run campaigns advertisements in ways that people can understand in their languages, in their community, in papers, on the news, to start to raise awareness of the dangers uh, to them and to their community in terms of pollution, therefore you lose your livelihood. Uh, in terms of, you, you, as you get there, you can 
harm yourself so you you're dead and then if your family loses a member and if you happen to be the head of the family earning the money you you're gone there also needs to be uh, conversations around uh, just the real loss to even our economy we all talk about wanting uh, all the basics constant water constant electricity fine i know there might be you know situations where the money is there some people might be embezzling it yes but people also need to understand that when you do activities like this it might be for short term gain but there's a long term uh, loss to the community to the society as a whole so i think over time with people being told uh, as well being uh, if, if you make them aware of all of these things it will stick in if i i use the example of recycling when i was born there was no recycling we dumped everything in the same bin my kids who are 13 were born with recycling they said to me mommy where do we put uh, the plastic or the can or whatever from the age of like 3 or 4 they know that because they grew up with it and now for them recycling is normal we may not be able to change the current adults now doing these activities but it's five 10 20 year campaign going into schools going into communities talking to people will change the next generation and let them know that these behaviors are not acceptable and they are dangerous so that is the advice that i would give because some countries cannot afford all these five dollar fix and things yeah. it's not affordable to them and some projects are not affordable we just need to keep educating people to stop these behaviors so that's what i would just and say I, i don't know if it will work or not but i think generally things like that do work through education also a fantastic uh, response to that question i don't know if anyone has anything else to say if not i'll call oh, okay um in general market yes please yeah go go yeah yes i i was just going to say a few add a few things to what nike just said that was a very great explanation because in the end um we like like you said in your lecture we are all responsible you know for uh, isd uh, and and that means that everybody must be made to realize that So I I would I would like to say that it's the the campaign that engineers being in charge most of most projects should lead the campaign you know of um, sensitizing people you know right from the villages and I guess that's that's one of the things or in fact I believe that that's one of the things that the branches of NSC should do um um the hazards are more in, uh, in in the oil producing area in Nigeria so we could have the branches in those areas start the campaign so uh it, we could add because at the last council of uh, Thursday um the community development was added as uh, one of the requirements or criteria criteria for group branch group dynamics so we could add that you know we could ask branches to start that campaign you know for for safety and um you know so i i i thank you for that response i will, i will take it up at the national level and see how we can involve our branches in the campaign thank you thank you very much thank you so much ma we really appreciate that thank you now totally i I'll also i just want to more or less kind of delve into the construction industry i want to kind of give a very good comparison to what we have in construction as well There was a time in construction that I'm so definitely uh engineer Sunday uh, Dr. Kokola and Jeremy Witness nobody was so much aware of about um, health and safety on site but all of a sudden things yeah. have changed everybody is now responsible for health and safety on site yes. and you know what even in documentation and enforcement on site before you get to site uh you must give us a well documented and approved SSOW like a safety system of work yeah it's very important document on site and one of the one of the key and even us we can we call them the most powerful personnel on the project team is the health and safety executive and representative she can he or she can come to site and tell you you stop work right now and you stop and that's how enforcement goes on construction site and these are the things that we think they can bring on board as well into all these other areas there must be documentation there must be uh, information that must be enforcement and again and enforcement yes let it be enforced let those 
if the document is not right. For example, you can't come to a construction site without an approved method of state method statement. What do you want to do? You don't. You can't. So you some know? sites don't even have they, they don't even have safety policy at all in place. Uh, exactly. And these are the documents we need to check before you can even yeah. come to solve the site. Yeah. And I think by the time we begin to imbibe this culture, the younger generations will now begin to realize, you know what, we are taking health and safety seriously. And I believe it's a very good way forward. Thank you so much for that. And on that note, we want to say thank you for all of us who are here and um, for all of us who have been on board, taking your time on a very bright and sunny Saturday to, uh, to honor us. Uh, we really appreciate you. Uh, we want to say thank you to uh, Engineer Olutoi Oyinoye. Is that you know Olutoi Oyinoye there? Can you just thank say you. a word or two? Yeah, you're welcome, sir. Thank you very much, sir. How are you today, sir? I'm fine, sir. You too? Can you, yeah, I'm fine, thank you. Can you give us one word about yourself? Sir? Can you introduce yourself, sir? You want to yeah. yeah, my name is Engineer Oluwatoi Oyinoye. I, I I just moved recently to the UK, and uh, just barely two months now. So I, I used to work. Hello? That must be some connection, uh, maybe issues there. Well, definitely, once he gets back to all, we get to know more about, about him as well. And uh, Natunia uh, Jala, elder statesman, how are you, sir? Are you doing good? It's so nice to have you now. Uh, it's um, Dr. Adedino back just to say hello to us from Glasgow. We need to be having a couple of collaborations with them this summer, by the grace of God. We're looking forward to that. Anyway, without much uh, to say, I would like to say thank you so much for coming. And um, this is just the icebreaker for our post COVID uh, interactive sessions. The next one is going to be on Saturday, 2nd of April at 2 p.m. at the Great Imperial College as well. It's going to be in person and online. And I can say definitely today has been quite productive, isn't it? I mean, let's just let's clap for Nyanyata today. She did very well. She did very well. You know, even it was so interactive and then uh, she made it very, very interesting as well. So on Saturday, 2nd of April at 2 p.m at the same venue here in person and online as well. We'll be having a, uh, a qualified architect, registered qualified architect, Ada Yovis Bravo, director and founding partner of MYAA. She's going to be talking to us about reconstruction of the UNESCO Sagra Familia through computational design. That is the thing to do, to go into computational design. This time around, we're talking tech now, we're talking yeah, technology, we're talking about computers. And it's one of those things that, we, because the kids coming after us, they are, they are into programming. Those kids are so good at programming. And I think very soon, all these two plus two is not going to be valid anymore. Everything is going to be computed. So I think that's, a, that's one of the things that we need to keep our breath uh, with. So on Saturday, keep it in your diary, 2nd of April. 2022 at 2 p.m. at Imperial College, and also it's going to be online. As usual, there's going to be uh, can I say proper lunch to be served or just snacks to be snacks? Exactly. In fact, in fact, I mean the 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 the, the guys inside are saying that's going to be all attacked on that day as happy things anyway. But you 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 you're most welcome to join us over here. We're having fun here. Trust me, we're having fun. Your beautiful environment here. I you can see you. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for coming. We've been much pleasure having you on board and have a wonderful, wonderful day ahead. The sun is still shining. Make the best of it. It might rain tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs> God bless. <laughs>
Hello, Doctor. Hello, Doctor Mukola. 